Hi, everybody. I, uh, oh, hold on. It's January the 27th, 2021. I hope that, uh, everybody's enjoying the weather out there. Personally, I can't get enough of the rain. I love it, um, all the time. I was actually really hoping that, uh, we would be able to do one of the live streams uh, when we were still outside in the rain, uh, the fall just didn't cooperate with us that way, and then it got too dark to go outside for these uh, on Wednesday nights. But um, maybe we'll get to do that in the spring. Um, days are getting longer. I guess um, daylight savings time will eventually make us, what do you, spring forward, and so that will mess up. That again, maybe, I don't know, I guess that's in April, so that's way too out there to even think about. Um, anyway, uh, that's it. Uh, oh, I wanted to bring up that um, we've been praying for Pastor Ed Abfonda um, down in Cyprus. He was in uh, ICU for covid and he has passed away. So he is in heaven celebrating with Jesus. No more fear, no more pain. Um, but his um, church is now missing their pastor. And his, uh, his family is missing their Ed. Uh, he wasn't uh, married. He didn't have any kids. So I, I guess that's a comfort it would be worse, hold on a second, if he was leaving behind children to me as a dad. But anyway, we we still should be lifting them up. So, um, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Simple Truth Church. We thank you that we can uh, still gather in your name. We can still study your word this way. Lord, we ask that you would bless us now as we... Um, study what you have to say to us, help us to hear, help us to understand, help us to take it on board and uh, change as a result of what you have to say to us. And Lord, we want to lift up uh, Calvary Old Path down in Cyprus, I ask that you would bless that church and uh, bless their pastor Daniel, uh, ask that you would um, give him the strength and the blessing of your Holy Spirit to lead that church and to comfort them through their loss and, uh, Lord, I just thank you that I got to know Ed. Um, thank you for his influence upon me. And uh, thank you for the lives that he touched. I ask that you would be glorified in his memory through those people. And I ask that you'd be glorified in what we do tonight as well. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So we're going to be in Matthew, four, Matthew Mark 14. My, my parents called me the other day just to make fun of me for mixing up Mark and Matthew several times last week. That's not the only reason they called me, but they did. Um, but hey, I can take it. Anyway, uh, if I make those mistakes, I trust that the rest of you are intelligent enough to know that I'm really talking about Mark. Last week, I said we would uh, get through as much of Mark chapter 14 as we could. That turned out to only be 12 verses. Uh, personally, I, I kind of liked doing that. Um, I learned a lot from the contrast between, uh, Mary's, <laughs> Mary's devotion and her, uh, just sold out. I want to give everything to Jesus attitude, uh, when she broke the flask and poured it over Jesus to anoint him. Um, and the contrast between uh, Mary and the Pharisees who were plotting to kill Jesus and also the contrast between Mary and Judas who was not sold out everything for Jesus no matter what. Um, he turned his back on Jesus because his expectations of what was going to happen were not being met. And I fully accept that maybe that's sort of my interpretation of Judas, his uh, motivations aren't exactly explained in uh, any of the Gospels. We don't really know 
a full reason why he decided to do that. Um, but it's just one of those things, um, you know, my opinion is just my opinion. And you, as a listener, should not, um, should not just take my word for it, I, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. But you should study on your own. You should learn on your own. And in fact, if you're, you know, if this is the only time that you open up your Bible, this is, if this is the only time that you learn what the Bible has to say, then, to be honest with you, these videos probably aren't going to do you a whole lot of good. It's almost like, um, this is the, uh, uh, I don't know, the wrap up, not really the, the meat of what you should be learning, but kind of the, um, the huddle afterwards. Like if this is all that you learn of the Bible, it's almost like you're putting on a exercise video on your uh, TV to follow along, but then you just sit on your couch and watch it. You're not going to get, um, <laughs> thanks Kathy I, you're not going to get any benefit if you don't read on your own That's I like to say that every once in a while just take it for what it is or don't make up your own mind Mark chapter 14 not Matthew we are going to be in um, picking up in verse 12 and I hope to get through a whole lot more tonight um, here we go and on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will, you have us to, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, Furnished and ready, there prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, wait, am I going that far? Yeah. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve, and as they were and as they were reclining at the table and eating, Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him, one after another, is it I? He said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. So, Jesus' Passover feast was prepared in much the same way as they prepared the donkey for him when he was going to ride that into the triumphal entry. It kind of just occurred to me as I was reading just now, it's kind of the Rube Goldberg of instructions that he gives the disciples of, hey, go to this place, and then you're going to see uh, a guy with a jug of water, and then you got to follow him, and then you got to talk to his master, and he's going to give you the upper room. Uh, it could be that this guy was a friend of Jesus. He was a disciple, maybe. Um, not one of the 12, but a follower. Uh, maybe he had arranged with Jesus earlier, hey, you can use my upper room for the feast, uh, or maybe, hey, who knows, it doesn't really even matter. Um, but the Passover feast itself is one of the biggest, was, I, I don't know if it still is, uh, the, one of the biggest celebration days in, is, in Israel. Um, in fact, the population of Israel was supposed to pretty much gather in Jerusalem, um, to celebrate together. And we mentioned last week that the scribes and Pharisees, as they were plotting Jesus' death, they decided they didn't want to do it. They didn't want to arrest him or, or execute him during the feast because there were so many people in Jerusalem and there was going to be so many witnesses to what they did. Um, the Passover feast was a special feast at the end of Passover week. And... Um, that includes what we just read, the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's all kind of part of Passover week. Uh, the feast was a celebration of God's deliverance of Israel from slavery in Egypt. And you can read about that whole story, the process from, you know, how the Jews became slaves in, in Egypt to uh, the oppression that they experienced under the pharaohs there all the way down to, you know, God bringing the 10 plagues 
uh, on Egypt so that they would be convinced to let Israel go. But that's all in like the first 12 chapters of Exodus. And it's a great story. But after all of the plagues, uh, you know, frogs and lice and darkness and the river of blood, uh, the last plague was the death of all the firstborn in Egypt. So God commanded Israel for the first Passover to prepare a lamb, one per household. And if, you know, you had a small household, maybe gather some of your neighbors together and, and stay in the house and um, slaughter the lamb, eat the lamb as the feast that night. And they were supposed to paint their doors, the you know, the doorway with the blood of their of that sacrificial lamb. And the blood on the doorway was a marker. So when the angel of death went out that night to slaughter all the firstborn in Egypt, he would see the blood on the door of God's people, of their house, and he would pass over the house. And so that's why it's called Passover. And of course, the Egyptians didn't do any of that. And so their firstborn died all that night. And the next day, Israel was freed. They were no longer slaves of Egypt, and they took off the promised land. Not quite as simple as that, right? But that's the feast of Passover. And it's no accident that Jesus is crucified during the Passover and he was arrested uh, during this night. Um, he's the lamb of our sacrifice, right? And because we are covered in his blood, then death passes over us also. And we're freed from slavery, not to Egypt, but to sin. So Jesus and his disciples, they gathered in the upper room, they celebrate Passover together. But as they're eating, Jesus announces this big bummer news. Hey, one of you guys is going to betray me. And, of course, we know that's Judas, in hindsight. And last week, we looked mainly at the root of Judas's betrayal. What was his motivation? Why did he do it? Uh, and we saw that, you know, when he discovered that what he had planned and what God had planned were different things... He turned his back on Jesus, and he um, kind of got whatever he could get on his way out. Hey, 30 pieces of silver, sure, I'll take that. Whatever it is that I can get, I'll get it on my, on my way out. Now, Judas's betrayal is one of those, like, it's blatantly evil. It's completely selfish. Uh, but the way that Jesus treats this betrayal, as he's talking about it with him and his disciples, is really interesting, because he doesn't treat it like something... Uh, he's not angry about it. He doesn't act, um, he just acts sad as if this wasn't something to get angry about, but it's just a, a sad tragedy. Um, Jesus is personally saddened be because, you know, having one of his friends betray him hurt him. Uh, this sentiment is echoed in one of the Psalms. This is Psalm 41 verse 9 says, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. So Jesus is saddened by this betrayal to himself personally. It hurts to have your friend turn your back on you. But he's even more sad because of how Judas is going to end up. He loves Judas. And yet he has to say, woe to that man. And he says it would have been better if that guy had just never even been born. He, it would have been better for him. Now, woe is an expression in the Bible, especially if you read it through uh, in the Old Testament. When it's, um, when it's uttered, it's there to draw your attention as the reader to something that is ex ex like really bad. You're supposed to stop and acknowledge, hey, this is a horrible thing that's happening. And when it's said about a person, it's an instruction for you as the reader, as a witness, uh, to feel sorry over what's going to happen to that person, that you should have some compassion on that person because it's going to go bad for them and there's nothing you can do. So all you can do is say, wow, that's horrible. Sorry about that. So even though Jesus willingly allowed himself to be betrayed, uh, and even though it was foretold in the Old Testament, Judas still bears the guilt for the choices that he made. And that's the tragedy of Jesus. That, that's why Ju Jesus was so sad over what was going to happen to him. Because Jesus is willingly going to his death so that he could forgive the sin, just like that betrayal uh, that of Judas turning his back on him. We know that Judas ends up committing suicide because he was 
uh, he felt guilty over what he had done. Um, and he can't live with that guilt for turning his back on Jesus. And it, you know, he could have returned to Jesus instead. He could have, um, sought forgiveness and he, I mean, it's my opinion. We won't ever really know, but he would have received the same forgiveness as all the the rest of the disciples when they were going to read about them uh, scattering and denying him. They had to be forgiven for that. And I think that Judas would have been forgiven for his betrayal just as much as Peter for denying him. That's my opinion. I can't back that up. That's just what I think about it. Um, but because he didn't, because he chose to commit suicide instead of seeking forgiveness, it really would have been better for him if he had never been born. And that's the same as anyone who rejects the forgiveness that Jesus offers us as human beings. If we reject his forgiveness, it would have been better for us if we had just never been born. Verse 22. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and he gave it to them and, and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when they had when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink it again. I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So this is the origins of our own celebration of God's deliverance of his people. Uh, we call it communion. Um, and I, I think that kind of looking and acknowledging that the roots of communion grow out of a Passover adds a lot to our understanding. Um, you know, our understanding not only of Jesus and his sacrifice, but of what we're doing when we celebrate communion together. Passover sheds a lot of light on communion. We celebrate a lot of the same things that the Jews celebrate when they celebrate Passover. Um, you know, Jesus, like we said before, is the the reason that death passes us over and we take in his sacrifice the body and the blood we take it into ourselves and it makes us free from the slavery that we're in and i, I like how jesus makes it clear that he is looking forward to when we can celebrate all together in heaven and he's talking specifically like hey i'm not going to drink this fruit of the wine until we drink it all together i i don't know it's going to be um, incredible when we're all together in heaven and we get to drink with Jesus and celebrate our, our forgiveness. I think it's going to be incredible. Verse 26. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away for it is written. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said emphatically, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. Now this announcement of their scattering is an interesting sort of counterpoint to the talk about the betrayal of Judas that they had during their meal. Uh, the betrayal of Judas and the scattering of the rest of the disciples share a lot of similarities, especially if you're looking at it specifically, uh, you know, comparing Judas's betrayal and Peter's denial. There's a lot of similarity similarities there, but the two things are different. They're different. For one, you can look at how the disciples react to Jesus's announcement. When Jesus told them, that one of them would betray him. It says they, they all got sorrowful. And they kept asking Jesus, hey, is it going to be me? Uh, they didn't know that Judas was going to be the betrayer. And they all suspected that it might be themselves. And that's that's fascinating to me. I don't know why, but that, that my brain is always kind of hooked on that thought of nobody pointed at Jesus at Judas. Sorry, they're all sitting around. Jesus says, one of you guys is going to betray me. And they all immediately pointed at themselves. Is it me? Could, could that be me? And on the other hand, when, G Jews, when Jesus announces that they're going to scatter like frightened sheep, they have a completely different reaction. Peter says, hey, if I have to die with you, I wouldn't deny you. 
And it says that everybody said the same. Everyone agreed with Peter. Yeah, that's how it's going to be, Jesus. No one is going to deny you. Nobody doubts himself here. Nobody has any inkling of like, is it going to be me? Could I be one who scatters? No, they all think that they are going to bravely lay down their lives for the sake of Jesus. And I think the problem is that they thought that um, they might be called to die with Jesus in battle. And, it, you know, even when Jesus gets arrested, uh, we're not going to get to that tonight, but next week, it says that Peter drew a sword and he just started chopping at people and whacked off a guy's ear uh, because he thought that's how it was going to go down. And when it becomes clear that Jesus isn't going to die gloriously in battle, leading a rebellion against Rome, but instead he's going to die disgracefully on a Roman cross, that's when they scatter. Uh, their expectations of Jesus, they're, actually, they're really not all that different than than Judas's expectations, which were disappointed. I mean, you read through the Gospels, it, it says that they fought with each other many times over which one of them was the greatest, which one of them was going to have the greatest authority in Jesus's kingdom. You know, they thought that Jesus was going to set them up on thrones. And it's those arguments show us that, at least in part, they followed Jesus because they thought that he was going to elevate them to greatness. I mean, that's not, obviously, that's not all the reason, but there's a part of them that thought, if I follow Jesus, it's going to pay off for me and I'm going to get elevated in life. Uh, but when Jesus surrenders to the authorities, when that whole show is shut down suddenly, they get shaken up. And they find out that they're not as brave as they thought they were. They find out that they're not as loyal a follower as they just claim to be. Uh, all of them scatter. But Peter, in particular, gets his face rubbed in it because of the claims that he made. Hey, Peter, you're not that good of a person. Hey, Peter, you're not that loyal of a disciple. Uh, and like I said, they all they all failed. But Peter needed to kind of just be bonked over the head with his self-confidence before he learned the lesson. And we can look at that and kind of point and make fun. I know I have. But this sort of thing happens to all of us. Uh, sooner or later, things are going to go really bad for you. But, I mean, maybe they are right now. Or maybe it's kind of been a long falling down process since this whole pandemic started. And you're still waiting to see when you hit rock bottom. And, you know, things are bad. You had these hopes and these expectations and you were banking on them and then all of a sudden it just gets yanked away from you and you learn something about yourself in those times, don't you? And chances are, you're not going to like what you see. And I was thinking about this this week as I was um, studying and it, it reminded me of potty training my kids. This is maybe not the best example, but this is what came to my mind. Um, because we had one kid in particular, and I'm not going to name him, um, but he was really difficult to potty train. And, and we had a lot of accidents and we had a lot of incidents that you could not call, call an accident. Okay. It was on purpose. And when he finally got it, when he finally was potty trained, I was just over the moon, like, yes. And the thought that was in my mind was I am never going to have to change another diaper in my life. That was, I thought that. And then shortly thereafter, Caroline brought to me a, a positive pregnancy test. And, hey, we're going to have another kid. And uh, I saw my freedom from diaper duty just yanked out of my, out of my hands. I was uh, so excited about that. And it just boom, gone. Nope. Guess what? There's more. And God kind of let me wallow in that for a little while. And then he just sort of whispered in my ear, hey, you're bummed out about changing diapers because you're selfish. And I didn't like learning that about myself. And I like to think that I've learned that lesson. I uh, frequently tell um, new fathers, like guys that are about to have their first child, I say, hey, look, here's the best possible scenario for you. This is the advice I give them. I ask them, hey, can I give you some advice? Because I've had some kids. I kind of know what it's like. Here's my advice for new fathers. The best scenario is that your wife never changes a diaper, that you change every single one. Probably isn't going to happen. 
But that's the best possible scenario. But anyway, I didn't like what I learned about myself. But here's the thing. Jesus wasn't surprised to learn that. Jesus knew already. Uh, he knew about my selfishness. He knew about all the other, like, uglier ways that I was going to fail in my life. And he knows about all the ways that I still have yet to fail in my life. And he chose me anyway to be his son. He isn't going to turn away from me now when I fall down. Because he saw it coming. Just like he saw um, the denial of Peter coming. He knew it was going to happen. He knew it before he chose Peter as his disciple. And yeah, Peter did fail and it was a pretty spectacular failure. Uh, we have it written down for us in detail. We have several different perspectives, almost like you're watching like an instant replay of a sporting event. And he didn't just fail to his, to live up to that claim that he was going to die with Jesus, but he denied even knowing Jesus three separate times. And in the end, he did it with an oath. Um, and to make it all worse, Jesus saw it happen. As he said the final time, hey, I don't know Jesus, and I swear to that, Jesus looked across the courtyard and made eye contact with Peter. And that's when it all came crashing down on Peter, and he ran off, weeping bitterly. In our terms today, he, we would say that he was sobbing uncontrollably as he ran off into the night. And where we are now in the book of Mark, not in the book of Matthew, Mark, Jesus told Peter that it was all going to happen. Jesus told Peter that this was going to be um, how it was going to go. But he finished with, after, I, after that, I'm going to go before you to Galilee. Jesus saw the failure, but he saw past the failure. And, and he, he warned them all that they were going to fail, not just Peter, but all of them. But he reminded them also that there's a future beyond the worst moment. And like I said, this is true for all of us. You know, Jesus... Jesus sees your failures. He saw them before you ever see him coming down the road. And he chose us anyway. Now, one of these disciples, not Peter, but um, John, who was one of the disciples who failed Jesus uh, that night, um, he had this to say. This is 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. It says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that should be our reaction when we fail. Now, next week, we're actually going to read through Peter's denial. And hopefully I didn't just burn through everything that there is to say about it, but we'll see. Uh, verse 32. And as they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John, and he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might, pay, might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again, he came, found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So, Whenever I think in my mind about Jesus willingly laying down his life, I, I think of the verses that talk about how Jesus was, uh, he had set his face to go to Jerusalem. And I, I picture Jesus, you know, we read about it earlier in the book of Mark, you know, Jesus walking ahead of his disciples as they were on their way to, to Jerusalem and they knew what was going to happen. He had told them he was going to die there and they're behind him marveling that he was still going. And I just picture Jesus, you know, unflinching, going to his death without any kind of hesitation or second thought. But this scene right here in Gethsemane reveals something different. This isn't a failure, 
Uh, it's not a lack of resolve or a weakness. But as Jesus prepares and felt prepares himself for what he knows is coming, there was great sorrow. And it says it was even he described it as sorrowful even to death, like he's gonna die of sadness for what he's about to go through. Um, there was agony. It, the Gospel of Luke records that he was so stressed that he was sweating blood. And it says that he was desperate. He was begging God repeatedly, begging God, hey, is there any other way besides what I'm about to go through? Can we cancel that and try a plan B? Is there a plan B? Um, he sought support from his closest friends. He physically fell down. He collapsed and prayed. And I think that as he came back to the disciples, he found them sleeping. The words he said to them applied to himself just as much as it did to them. He said, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So I think it's inaccurate to think of Jesus just striding to the cross, smiling and unbothered. It's inaccurate and it's harmful. I think that we need to see that the cross was difficult for Jesus and um, not just this light thing. Uh, seeing Jesus this way reminds us that Jesus really does relate to our humanity. Just like it says in the book Hebrews, this is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And also seeing Jesus this way reminds us that, that salvation isn't cheap. It comes to us freely, but it was bought at a tremendous price. Even the anticipation of what was going to happen was a torment to Jesus. But ultimately, he was willing to pay that price. As it says, this is not the book of Mark, but Matthew. The book of Matthew, chapter 13, verse 44 through 46. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great, great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. So we should remember the cost of salvation as it's pictured here. Jesus paid all that he had to gain us, to, to buy our salvation. Um, I, I think sometimes the agony of his sacrifice gets kind of lost in the gory details that we have of his physical torture. You know, and as, as horrible as all of that was, the whipping, the beating of the soldiers, um, the mocking, everything else, horrible. But Jesus suffered on a different level, a level that no human being will ever have to suffer. It's impossible for us to, to know what, what it was like. He is the creator of life. That was his idea. He invented life, and yet he experienced death. And after an eternity of perfect fellowship with the other aspects of the Holy Trinity, Jesus was cut off. And these things, this idea of the cost of salvation, and we, we see it pictured here as Jesus is just in agony in the garden, they should wake us up. If we ever begin to feel cavalier about sin as though it's no big deal to sin because we're forgiven. And anytime I want forgiveness, I get it freely from, from God. Freedom comes to us freely, as we said, but it, it, Jesus paid the highest price so that we could have that forgiveness. So, the weight of all that was to come, it just bore Jesus to the ground. And the disciples were no comfort to him. They didn't help. God the Father does not answer Jesus. You know, if my son came to me in agony and he is um, afraid of what he's about to go through, I would think that I would at least give him a little pep talk, maybe a little encouragement. Hey, Jesus, you can do it. But God the Father doesn't answer Jesus. He doesn't give him any encouragement. Uh, the disciples don't even like pat him on the back. Hey, Jesus, it'll be okay. We'll be here with you. Nothing. No pep talk, nothing. Um, but Jesus prayed to God and he asked to be spared. But he also said, yet not what I will, but what you will. 
And, and don't forget what he said to Peter, right? When they came to arrest him, uh, he said that, hey, Peter, we don't need to fight. If we wanted to, I could call down 12 legions of angels to come and rescue me. But he didn't. Jesus saw the horror of what he was going to go through, and he chose to go through it. He wasn't helpless. He didn't have to do it. He wasn't passive about it. He didn't just kind of roll over. But he knew what was going to happen, and he knew that it was the only way to save us. And so he actively submitted to the will of God, and he chose to die for us when it was our only hope. And, I mean, what else can you say after that? But you know, there's no way you can doubt now that Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you and he loves you at your worst. He loves you even when he knows that you're going to fail him. And he loves us enough to give us a future beyond that failure, just like he did with the disciples. After he told them, hey, you're going to fail me, you're going to scatter. But afterwards, I'm going to go before you. Meet me there in Galilee. So he does that with us also. He, he sees us. He chose to forgive us. He chose to pay whatever cost it would take to forgive us. And he sees a way past that. He sees that there is going to be more beyond your worst day that you're still going to be able to serve me because he forgives us. So thank God he loves us. Let's pray. Lord God, we are so grateful for the mercy that you've given us. We're so grateful that you chose to pay that price, that you chose to, to go through with the agony that you saw coming. Lord, we are humbled. We are just, I don't even know what to say about it. I'm speechless. I'm thankful and ask that you would help me to, to be, uh, help me to do what I need to do. Lord, help me to, uh, move beyond my failings. Help me to move beyond my, uh, shortcomings, all of us, Lord, and help us to move forward with you and walk in that grace and mercy that you've given us and, and to serve you continually every day in Jesus name. Amen. All right, everybody. Uh, enjoy that weather. I hope that you don't lose any power tonight and may God give you grace. Good night.